Someone who's familiar with exactly what it takes to develop and run a successful race team at the top level is the former head of operations at the world champion Red Bull Formula One racing team, Professor Richard Hopkins. We're so glad that he's been able to join us in the studio today. You've had an amazing career in Formula One that started way back with the Brabham team and doing up seatbelts for the multiple world champion Ayrton Senna uh, when you were a young mechanic. Uh, give us a bit of a, an outline of the journey you've had in Formula One. Will do, yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's been a fairly decent rise. I wouldn't necessarily say to fame, but certainly in, for myself, been uh, very happy with my career path. It, uh, it kind of came out of nothing. Grew up always being a Formula One fan, but really back when I was a young lad, had no aspiration of being in Formula One. I think at that very early age, I think I saw Formula One as being so aspirational and, and to the point of being unachievable. However, being at school, watching Formula One on TV every Sunday evening, and uh, back then in the day, it wasn't shown live. It was just a high package on, on a Sunday night with James Hunt and Murray Walker. Uh, certainly part of my upbringing was very much to watch Formula One, but part of the deal of staying up late on a Sunday night was my father forced me also to watch Monty Python. That was another part of my education. But yeah, just a, an opportunity came about whilst I was at school. I was 15 years old and the teacher announced that all the kids had to go and do a week's work experience. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do until I got home and it was my father who said, well, why don't you go and do a week at a Formula One team? To which I laughed, and I think my mother laughed along too, thinking what a you know, crazy idea that would be. However, I, I phoned a couple of teams, first one being McLaren, who didn't operate anything like that at the time, second one, and this was purely geographical from where my house was, and the next one was Brabham. And they said yes, uh, and along I went, and uh, you can't imagine my excitement. And uh, I think I must have made a reasonably decent impression because it was only sort of four or five months later that uh, I phoned them up and asked if I could go and visit again for the day and see the new car and see all the friends that I'd made. Um, but they invited me along about three o'clock in the afternoon, which I was really disappointed about because I was hoping to spend the whole day there. But I walked through the door and they interviewed me and offered me a job on the spot, which just absolutely knocked me for six. I got home, my parents didn't believe me. I had to phone them back up again and say, did that actually really happen? I had my last exam at the age of 16 at school and uh, on the Thursday and I started at Brabham's working for a Formula One team at the age of 16 on the Monday. Um, a great education and almost sort of apprenticeship was served at Brabham. I pretty much did every department. Swept the floor and worked in sub-assembly in the gearbox department, did a bit of time in the drawing office, pretty much saw everything. And I think that's what really gave me the foundation for me to sort of you know, move my way through different uh, positions throughout Formula One. So that was great. Um, unfortunately, Brabham's folded at the end of 91, and uh, if the truth were known, I'd probably still be there today if they were still operating. Great team, great atmosphere, great group of people, um, and really focused on what they were doing. Unfortunately, they were on a bit of a downturn as far as success went, but still a great team. And then McLaren came along. Um, which was just you know, a fantastic opportunity, quite daunting going to the multiple world champions. They were always seen as just a cut above the rest you know, from an application and engineering point of view. And of course, run by Ron Dennis, who you know, is a legend in the sport. Um, so amazing opportunity. Uh, I was in sub-assembly for a couple of months and then started going racing and testing. And, uh, and I, you mentioned it briefly, you know, my first folly with, uh, with uh, actually working on a Formula One car at a racetrack was in Brazil, uh, a test in Brazil before the Grand Prix. And, and the first thing I pretty much did was do the seat belts up of Ayrton Senna, which was just, you know, not long before, you know, uh, been watching him on TV and, and admiring him, had posters on the wall, and here I was doing his seat belts up. Uh, Travelling the world continued for nine or ten years after that uh, until, um, you know, I wanted to take the next step. And that was really understanding and highlighting that as much as Formula One was fantastic, and we all look at Formula One even today as this absolutely slick machine, but it, it has its, you know, it has its weaknesses like anything else. And, and certainly back then there was a weakness in the organisation of the business, how it 
didn't run as efficiently as it could. And I just saw an opportunity to maybe improve things back in the factory, slick things up a bit, um, and hopefully that would translate into performance on the track. Um, I'll try and be as nice as I can with this next bit, but, uh, but McLaren may be a bit stuck in their ways, a bit traditional with their approach. Um, didn't necessarily want to fully adopt my, my way of thinking. So then followed an opportunity at Red Bull at the uh, end of 2007. Um, and I was, uh, you know, worked with Adrian quite a lot, Adrian Newey. So Adrian certainly had a vision of, of going Formula One, uh, racing in a slightly different way to everybody else. Innovation in Formula One has always been prevalent, but certainly then it was time to turn a bit of a corner and really accelerate the rate of, of innovation. And of course, you need a, an organization that can keep up with that pace. Um, and that was my job, to turn what was a group of 650 individuals very focused in what they were doing, um, but not really at the point of believing that success was achievable. So as much as it was my job to change the fundamentals in how the business ran, it was also a job of changing the hearts and minds of 600 people to believe that success was possible. Um, and cut a long story short, that's kind of what I did. And uh, 18 months after me arriving, we won our first Grand Prix in China in 2009, finished first and second. It was a wet race, but a, but a, a great victory, a great first victory. And then the momentum grew. Uh, world Championships obviously followed and, and many more wins and successes. So yeah, that, 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 that's, that's pretty much my, my 28 years in Formula One in a, in a nutshell. Well, it sounds to me like you've, you've taken that hands-on experience and really created a career that's a career journey that's led to leadership. But you never went to university, but now you're a professor. What sort of words of wisdom would you <laughs> offer to these students that's, about, that's about that of, career that's, journey? That's kind of ironic. Look, you know, my, throughout my school, I wasn't necessarily the best student. Uh, too many distractions in life, maybe. Uh, however, you know, if Formula One didn't come about, there was a journey planned into college and later, hopefully, on, on to university. Obviously, the, the offer of working for a Formula One team at the age of 16 was just something that I couldn't, you know, uh, look over. So, so my path did change. Um, and one became a very hands-on experience. Not that tertiary education, but a different form of education, a, an education in industry. It is somewhat ironic now that I am a, a professor, professor of practice. Um, so yeah, uh, if my mother was still around, I think she'd be laughing all the way to, to imagine that, yes, I didn't go to university, but now I find myself as a, as a professor. So clearly you obviously don't have to go to university to be a success, particularly in something like Formula One. So, so when would a student look at, say, taking a trade rather than going straight to university? Hey, look, I, I think the world has changed slightly. We're talking, you know, when I made this decision, it was over 30 years ago, and, and maybe having that tertiary education, having that degree was lesser important than it is today. However, university isn't for everybody, you know? So for sure, having a degree today certainly helps you. It helps you get in the door of a lot of organizations, certainly even Formula One teams today. But there is still a choice. Yeah. There is still a choice. There is a choice to, to take a similar path to what I did and take that learning experience outside of an educational experience. And there's still a lot of benefit in doing that, for sure. So in another part of your journey, you, you took your F1 experience and turned it into creating the Sun Swift Solar Car, which won a world title at your first attempt. What sort of uh, way of transferring that F1 skills across to that were you able to use? I think, I think Formula One, you know, stands for excellence. It stands for approach and structure in what we do and efficiency. And, and Formula One teaches a lot of people these days. You know, Formula One has certainly uh, found its way into many different industries and in the way it applies itself and the way it approaches things. Famously, um, a... a, a surgeon at Great Ormond Street Hospital, Children's Hospital in London. Massive for Formula One fan, massive Ferrari fan, but that, I won't hold that against him. <laughs> was watching television, saw a Formula One pit stop and realized that there were things that were happening in Formula One pit stops that he could translate and transfer 
into the operating theatre. No, they didn't start changing wheels on patients and refuelling them, but certainly some of the activities that happen, some of the efficiencies and the focus that Formula One teams have yeah. are transferable. So certainly with the SunSwift Solar Racing team, absolutely, you know. Um, I think they benefit from it. <laughs> You'll have to ask the students. So where do you think participating in F1 in schools can lead, lead students? Look, I think it's an amazing opportunity. It's an opportunity that I wish I had when I was that age, absolutely, 100%. Look, I think, the, once again, the world has changed slightly, that hands-on approach when you're growing up, and if you aspire to be an engineer nowadays, maybe there aren't the same opportunities that I had when I was growing up. I had a scale electric set. I built Meccano. I had a push bike that its chain fell off pretty much every time I rode it. So I had to become a hands-on engineer at the age of 10, 11, 12. And I think nowadays with devices and everything else, maybe kids aren't as hands-on as they would have been in my day. So I think Formula One in schools allows them to take what they're learning in the classroom and absolutely apply it practically. So where do you think F1 in schools participants should focus their energy? Well, if, look, if they want to go into Formula One, it's look, it's, it's take what you're doing now, try and understand what discipline you're either good at or you want to aim towards and, and take it on from there. Look, Formula One in schools is such a great stepping stone for these guys. Um, it's, it's, a, it's such a rich environment to learn, supported brilliantly by Re-Engineering Re Australia also. Well, Professor Richard Hopkins, thanks for your time and your words of wisdom. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs>